Welcome to the Handful of Leaves episode. I am Cheryl. Today, our topic is how to deal with an insane world and how to let go of expectations of other people. I aspire to practice doing good, take the five precepts, avoid evil and purify our minds. How can we practice in such a way that we don't suffer over our expectations? We will begin with this let's be real question of the day, which is everyone judges. So how can we be less judgy? The guest is Sister Sylvia. She's an experienced Dharma speaker, practitioner, and scholar. She has a lot of experience in Dharma practice. I'm very excited to invite her. Welcome, Sister Sylvia. Hello. You have asked a very pertinent question. If I want to be a Dharma practitioner, I need to do all the good things and avoid all the negative words, conduct. Amongst the many things that I must avoid include being less judging. Being judging is a very natural human instinct. For the longest time, through many lives, we have survived and thrived through ignorance. Actually, it's because we are ignorant. We Humans operate very instinctively. Part of our instinct is to protect this person. Num- I call it number one. Number one. You protect number one by trying to suss out the the threat and then you deal with threats by either beating them up or pushing them away or you run away, fight or flight. That has been the instinct of all living beings. If we perceive that the threat can be handled by just fighting, the odds are you will fight. Why would you fight? Flee. Fighting requires churning of adrenaline. I said all these things about churning of adrenaline, learning to fight people, and so on and so forth. It's really because all of us are underpinned by certain instincts. Mm. We call it loba, greed, dosa, anger, delusion, moha. As long as we have moha, delusion, our instinct is, I, I see a threat, I will fight you. In my view, judging mm. is part of threat assessment if you judge someone to be no threat Mm. helpful can serve my interests you're still judging if you perceive that way you are inclined to lean closer to that person Mm. if you perceive that this is someone who can threaten your interests cause you displeasure pain inconvenience then you are judging you Mm. will judge critically you will say, I don't like this person. And then in your mind, you'll cite all the negative behavior to justify your feelings. But your feelings mm. are all about what you perceive to be a threat. You want to learn not to judge critically. You will judge, but you try to judge not critically in a way that triggers your anger, your greed. You want to assess in that way. In my mind, you will need to have very steady, almost instinctive arising of mindfulness. Mm. Can you explain to me the difference between perceiving, judging, and judging critically? Perceiving is natural. Mm -hmm. Because the word perceiving means I I recognize something, I label, I know what it is. That is part of perception. In Pali, we call it sanya. Any data processed through your sense basis, sitting on learned memory. So your sight, your hearing, somebody's voice, sound, what I smell, taste, touch. And of course, there's mind. But any of these data processed through your sense basis, you recognize, you know, you label it. That is perception. It mm. is a function of the mind. That's all. It enables you to recognize what's there. You recognize it. Once you recognize, you must decide what to do with it. Mm. Okay? It's a mechanical thing. When you recognize, because it sits on learned memory, the memory you had of whatever is pleasant. You recognize it, Delight will arise. Mm. Naturally. Naturally. It is natural because it literally sits on learned memory. Otherwise, you won't recognize it. Anyone born after the, the smart devices come into play, 
you're born after that. You live your world through that. You will not know how to use a dial phone. You look at a dial, the rotary phone, you won't know what to do with it. You will see numbers and you say, what is this about? In fact, the other day, I saw a little TikTok thing where the father was trying to tell the, the daughter, use it, call this number. The daughter doesn't know it, doesn't recognize mm. it. Mm. In her memory, there isn't such a device. Yeah. If you had not had an experience with something, you won't recognize it. Then in your perception, there's nothing there. Now, that is perception. In the perception, there will be feelings. Feelings and perception come together. In the arising, the perception you recognize, then there is a strong feeling. Strong, pleasant, strong, painful, unpleasant. If it's neutral, you will not remember. But if it's mm. strong, pleasant, or strong, painful, you will remember. And then you will store it as good or bad. Desirable, not desirable. I want more of this or I, I don't want that. It, all this will come with it. Mm. So when you look at something, immediately, instinctively, undesirable. I don't like it. I, this must go away. Then you're judging critically. That's when you're critical. When you judging, assessing, is this to my benefit or not? How does this help me or not? Or is it going to be harmful? That instinct is natural. You mm. want this instinct to stop or halt or not be so quick. You need to have mindfulness. Mm. The mindfulness is not about outside. It's about inside. Mindful of your feeling. Mindful of how your mind leaps to conclusion. Mindful of how your mind wants to make decision, wants to react. Mindful of that part. Not mindful of what's out there. I'm mindfully looking at this person walking. No, no, it's not that. It's mindfully looking at your mind and your feeling mm. and your commentary on what's going on out there. Stop being critical. Stop judging negatively with anger. You have to watch your feeling. You have to see that it is detached and so it is neutral. The feeling is neutral. There is no arising of strong feelings. You just watch it. You're mindfully watching how the feeling stays neutral. If there is an arising of unpleasant, you don't go look at the object out there. You look at the feeling and look at perception. Why is it unpleasant? If you can, because you're mindful, you say, we'll switch it to wholesome, to compassion. This is changing your own narratives. Because when you see something unpleasant, the instinct is to judge harshly. To say, this person is not nice. He's being mean. He's being cruel. Your anger will engage. Because fight or flight. Okay, that's a human instinct. But you don't want that to happen. You want to be of help. You have to change the narrative into something positive. Mindfulness is an enabler. It enables you to turn it to something positive, more constructive. You will say to yourself, this person has a bad day. This person is in a lot of pain. I don't want to add to his pain. I engage him. There will be pain all around, anger all, all around. I don't want to do that. One way of talking is using mindfulness. You can use any of the wholesome mental states. But you must convert. You must convert to a wholesome mental state. You can convert using patience, metta, faith. The Buddha's Dhamma says to always extend friendliness, to not give in to this anger and agitation. The Buddha reminds us that we will live and die. Everything is impermanent. Mortality is real. So mm -hmm. when you have this kind of reflection, you are able to remind yourself, keep cool, keep detached, don't get engaged. Mobility is very powerful. And this one is using wisdom and faith. Mm -hmm. Why this is wisdom and faith? If I believe in the Dhamma, I want to call myself his disciple. I totally say I am his disciple. Yes. If you want your teacher to be proud of you, you cannot just give in to your craziness. Your teacher will be proud of you if he knows that you have tried your best to practice in accordance with his dhamma. Mm. His dhamma says, avoid evil, do good. 
purify my mind. And you say, okay, I must purify my mind. I will not react. That is true faith, true wisdom. The teacher says that you need to keep reflecting on mortality, impermanence. I will mm. grow old, I will fall sick, I will die. And I will be separated from the people I love. And the only thing I bring along is my comfort. Okay? Your daily reflection will change. Your, it will start to shift your instinct. Think about yourself ha having been diagnosed with end-stage cancer. If you're in that state, you think you'll be petty? You think you'll fight back? No, because I, I could say, die any moment. You'll die any moment. The Buddha himself said uh, it's very powerful. It will be of great benefit to you if you do this five reflections. You will reflect on the five themes. You go to bed, you say thank you for one more day of life. If tomorrow I wake up, I will remember to honor the Buddha by doing good. Mm -hmm. By walking the Dhamma path. Therefore, leaning towards wholesome, leaning away from unwholesome. It's mm -hmm. a reminder. A human is wholesome. Mm -hmm. It's because of wholesomeness that got you a human rebirth. But why are there so many humans who are unwholesome? When they come into this world, they're okay. But over time, because of ignorance, they learn all the wrong things. Mm. They are told by the conditions around them that you should stand up for your right. Isn't that what we've been told? You do not become a softie because people bully you. Isn't that what we are told? Some of us will be taught. People push you, must push back. You have wrong teaching around you perpetuated by people who care for you, unfortunately. Mm. Because they care for you, you see, they don't want to see you being bullied. So their advice to you is, stand up for your right, fight back. Mm. I am not saying you be a wimp. I'm mm. saying you hold the mental states and not respond. Can I share an example on why I think that is very difficult. I see my parents getting very angry. Let's say they have the tendency to want to fight back with a neighbor. A lot of anger, a lot of hatred because they believe that's the way to win and be strong in yeah. life. Yeah. For me, the frustration would arise because my intention is to be helpful. But then whatever that I try to teach them, it goes way past their heads. And you I know them. You don't teach. Is that the loving them? You, you let don't, them suffer. You don't try and share the ma mm. when a person is not ready to hear. We don't go around and try and get another to hear us. When you try to get someone to change, mm. you have one thing. Therefore, you are in pain. The four noble truth when you have desires, you will have to cur mm. suffering. If you have acceptance, you will experience the cessation of Dukkha. We suffer because we want them to change. You don't have to want them to change. You just have to stand by your money in case you're going to pay indemnity. <laughs> <laughs> in order for character change to happen, you need five conditions. And this one is not said by the Buddha. I'm just telling you the five <laughs> conditions from worldly experience. But I'm sure the Buddha will approve. Condition one is you must have self-awareness. You don't think you have done anything wrong. Nothing is going to work. There must be a recognition there is a problem. You recognize it. Some people recognize it, you don't do anything. Finish, game's over. You recognize there's a problem. You want to fix that problem. There must be a will, a desire to fix the problem. You must know the steps to fixing the problem. Then you must put in effort to fix that problem. Imagine a case where I have self-awareness. I know there's a problem. I want to go and fix it. But I'm very lazy. I also don't know how to do it. Nothing happens. Mm. Okay? If I say, I got a problem. I want to go and fix it. I'm going to work very hard. But I have no self-awareness. I don't know what that problem is. I didn't know that. I think I got a problem. Because people don't like me. It must be a problem. But I don't know what it is. Self-awareness, meaning you know what is your problem. You know what you must fix. Then you want to do something about it. You want to. I got anger management issue. I go and sign up for anger management courses. They teach you the steps. Then you learn very hard. Very hard. Then you try. And then some days you fumble. And then you give up. 
So the will must come in. Eh? Okay, what's the fifth one? I said there were five, right? The fifth one is mm-hmm. you have someone to cheer you on. That Kalyana meter. It's because humans are social creatures. They can be changed for the positive, beneficial, or they can be flipped the other way. If they're very strong will and they have very strong moral compass, you cannot shift them. But if their will is not very strong, not very strong moral compass, a bit f- flimsy, a bit scary, and then they, they will shift. If they didn't think they've done anything wrong, game's over. <laughs> you try and change them, they are going to get angry with you. You might as well just sit down there and, as I said, get your money ready in case you're going to pay indemnity. <laughs> Then, then you say, well, then what can I do? What, how can I help? Mm. You help by walking the path and becoming a happier, successful person. It's a long-term thing though. Like, mm. how does it help the problem? The immediate problem will take time to solve. Mm. Now, let me explain why you must be the representative of the teaching. At some point, they will realize that they are in trouble. When that will happen depends on their own wisdom, their own awakening. When they realize that they have a problem, they will look around for a solution. If you are successful because our material base lay world applauds success. If you are a lay person, you want to share the dhamma, but people around you say that you don't have education or your, your education is not very high. You can't really speak very well. You get people very confused by what you are saying. But you're actually not bad. You're very wholesome. They might like you as a person, but they're not going to learn from you. Especially mm. if they perceive that you're not very successful. They won't want to learn from you. Because you're a lay person. If you're a Sangha, what kind of teacher you want to follow? What lay Enlightened person? teacher. <laughs> Enlightened teacher, because the definition of success is a calm, peaceful, serene, light-hearted person. He must have got it right. This one very good. Look at how calm he is, how light he walks. Oh, I like it. But he's sangha. If you're a lay person, you try to work hard to provide for your family and all. But people find out that you're in debt half the time. They will still label you as not very successful. Then you can't tell them to avoid even do good. <laughs> <laughs> avoid even do good. Verify your mind. They'll say, but who are you to tell me? You can't mm. even get your act together. You can't even get your life together. Mm. Element of respect towards a lay teacher is very important. Respect is an extremely important condition for learning. I will learn from you if I respect you. I must respect you for various things. One is for your knowledge. Okay? Two... I must believe that you choose to walk away from wealth and material success, even as a lay teacher. You are not poor because you fail in your profession. You lead a simple life by choice. I then respect you. Parents are very judging, unfortunately. We will use all kinds of benchmarks to gauge, as proxy gauge to our calculation of whether or not so and so is worthy of me following them. I'm not saying I am like this. I'm just saying that humans think like that. The Buddha said the three kinds of people in the world, right? The fully blind, the full-sighted, and the one eye. What is blind? You are dismal failure in your material, secular life. You're dismal failure. And spiritually, you have nothing. Mm. You're blind. If you are a roaring success in your secular life, so materially you earn a lot, buy house, Mm. buy car, but spiritually you run on an empty tank. Mm. Who does say one eye? What is fully sighted, full sighted, two eyes? You're both successful in your material secular life and spiritually you are also doing good. That's full sight. So you stay in a lay life, it is okay to earn a good living, provide well for your family, and have some of the trappings of a successful lay life. 
it's perfectly okay. Just make sure that how you earn your living didn't cause hurt and harm to another. I think there are a lot of one-sided people um, at the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do to maintain our integrity and stay steadfast in our values in environments where even the dishonest behaviours are not only prevalent but also encouraged? One very mm. wrong assumption is that you have to break precepts, like you have to tell a lie. You have to compromise on your values and principles to secure your success. I consider that a wrong assumption. Totally wrong. Let me ask you this. You have a business deal with somebody. He makes you good money. But then you found out that he cheated you. You're going to do business with him? Not anymore. Not anymore, right? The odds are a lot of people will like, I find out you cheat, I'm not going near you. And you're going to tell people. That there will be someone who will like, make sure that he is caught. Now, let's say he didn't cheat you. But you found out that he's a womanizer or she is unfaithful in marriage. There will be a part of you that says, he hasn't done me any wrong, but I really don't trust him now. Mm. So that will affect his business, right? Social standing. He's a doctor, a lawyer, a professional. He either siphoned some money or worse, all he did was caught with drunk driving. Mm. Then it flashed all over the newspaper. Can you imagine how all these is going to end up in the social media, into the newspaper, everybody having a view? Your reputation as an honest man. You can earn less for your principle. Actually stands you in very good state. Then why so is it so common that everyone lies in the workplace? <laughs> not, not common. People may or may not lie outright. But they will fudge the truth. Mm. They, they make it murky. The reason why people do that is either because it usually for an honest man to suddenly tell one lie, it has to do with fear. And the fear can be very simple. This inconvenience, I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know what to say. Then I, True. it's easier to make it vague. Because we fear. You're afraid of being scolded. You're afraid of people telling you off. You're afraid of losing the business. Fear. If you are honest, and you treat people fairly, and you are candid in the way that you explain things. People trust you. And once there is that trust, then you will find many doors open. Many people want to do business with you, want to engage you, want to deal with you because they know they can trust you. Trust is an extremely precious commodity. That's the one that gets you that extra mile ahead. Not the conniving and maneuvering, playing games, fudging truths. Th those are the things when you are found out, that's it, you know. Your reputation is over. Even if it's a very small thing, people will talk. If you have a reputation of being fair-minded, an honest broker, frank and, and sincere in your dealings, respectful and considerate. He will suffer some losses, but he's prepared to do that. This kind of people will have a very good standing. And the Buddha will call it, in an assembly, he is respected. And he may be slow, but steadily, he will gain his ground. I'm very confident about this. Contemplate on the benefits of keeping mm -hmm. to our five precepts. The long-term benefits of in, ter in terms of this life and the next life as well. And to really think about the drawbacks of not keeping your precepts. And what happens like when your lies or your misconduct gets oh, out no. in the open. To me, precept is the lowest bar possible. Hmm. Because five precepts, in the traditional rendition of it, right, I undertake to up observe, uphold, hold on to the precept of not taking life. I undertake to observe precepts of not taking things not given. And this is all the, I will not do this wrong thing. Mm. To me, it's a very low bar. 
minimal bar. Actually, it should go into the flip side. I not only not take life, I will uphold, I will look after, I will protect, I will support life. Mm -hmm. Not only it's not about taking, it's also about giving, mm -hmm. being generous. It's not just about sexual misconduct, uh, abstaining from it, but it is to honour, respect, relationship, mm -hmm. keeping up your promises. It's about speaking truth, being honest in and out. In means inside here. <laughs> you're upright, mm -hmm. you're, you're telling yourself the truth. Because this one is very powerful. Because the practice is about seeing reality as it is. Which means the mind needs to, to sweep away the fuzziness, mm -hmm. all those illusions and delusions of life. You've got to cut the natural instincts of the mind to overlook truth. Mm -hmm. We always talk about reality as it is. But what does that mean? Seeing the impermanence of the aggregates, the dukkha, the suffering, seeing the anatta, soullessness, substancelessness of the mm. aggregates and the sense spaces. When we go to bed at night, assuming we'll wake up tomorrow. Correct? Mm. Yes. Who goes to bed saying tomorrow I will be dead? Nobody. <laughs> one night. This is only one night. Which means you won't die. Because mm. every night you go to bed, assuming you will live through, you wake up tomorrow and you live through the day. Mm. You have this built-in instinct that life is permanent. Hypothetically, you will die, but not yet. Mm. The built-in instinct is you don't see mortality. It's a given. And we are blind to it. Why is this so important? Why must you see mortality? To see mortality is to truly appreciate Dukkha. I already said, if you have been diagnosed with end-stage cancer, you will live with death in your face day in, day out. And so therefore, it is painful because we don't live with death in our face. Because we live in delusion of immortality. Life, we can plan, we can hope, we can dream, no pain. Mm -hmm. You take away hope, you take away dream, you take away plan, you're only staring at death, pain. Mm -hmm. That's why the Buddha said, if it is impermanent, is it painful or is it pleasant? You would say painful, yeah. right? We live life blinded by dreams, blinded by hopes and ambitions. Mm -hmm. We're blinded. We don't see death. You don't see death. You can dream, you can hope, you can plan for your holiday next, time, next month down the line, etc. Because of that, by thinking about the plan, you're happy. Mm. So your happiness, your joy, your delight, sits on plan, dreams, mm. hopes. If death is in your face, where are the dreams and hopes and faith? And because now we will not, lose I'm everything. Not... And because we will perfection. lose everything with death. Not, there's perfection. nothing that we can really bring along with us except our karma and merits. Except your karma and your merits. Two straightforward, simple things. Simple mm. drivers. The average person don't think about it. They don't see it. They live life oblivious to these two. Mm. So when I say see reality, as it is, when the Buddha said that, Yata Buddha Niyana doesn't, it is nothing to do with some mystical reality. This is the reality. Okay? With that, we can end this episode. For our listeners, if you enjoy this episode, please give us a five-star rating. That will really help boost our viewership and listenership. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you. Stay happy and wise.